Egypt, the gift of the Nile. The nation owes its very existence to the waters of the great river, which for thousands of years has made barren land fertile, given life to one of history's great civilizations, and sustained a population now approaching 80 million people. And yet, those same waters are now threatening some of the world's most spectacular monuments. The ancient temples of Luxor and Karnak, and several others in southern Egypt, are in real danger from rising groundwater in the Nile Valley. The monuments of Egypt are suffering a lot. But I'm a man in the field, and I'm trying to do what we can to save these monuments. But still, I'm not optimistic. The River Nile has always flooded annually, its silt acting as a natural fertilizer on submerged land in the Nile Valley. But the construction of the Aswan High Dam in the late 1950s allowed farmers to irrigate their crops up to three times a year, and land is now almost constantly underwater. The widespread use of salt-based fertilizers, combined with natural minerals from the riverbed, have caused the floodwaters to become increasingly saline. And this salt water is beginning to destroy the ancient temples. If we don't get our act together and do something quite serious within the next 10 years, there aren't going to be any monuments left to protect. It is that bad. Dr. Ray Johnson has worked for the University of Chicago in Luxor for nearly 30 years, documenting and restoring unique treasures dating back some 4,000 years, many of which could soon be lost forever. The uh, local Egyptians tend to over-irrigate, and this is the source of the problem. Uh, dissolved salts get sucked up into the foundations and lower wall and column courses of the temple. The water itself eventually evaporates through the porous stone, but the salts and the minerals stay inside the stone. And it travels to the surface of the stone and crystallizes. And the crystallization process expands and cracks and just blows apart the surface of the stone. In some cases, uh, it turns the stone actually to sand. And of course, it's the surface of the stone walls and columns that's, that has all the decoration, so the decoration goes with it. And the color change visible in these stone blocks is a sure sign that they have been damaged by the absorption of salt water. Here we make a simple demonstration for how capillarity works. We pour some water in a simple dish, representing the ground. We use a simple cardboard tube and put it into the water. And you will gradually see how the water is sucked up into the tube. The tube represents, in this simple demonstration, the stone foundations and columns in the temples. As you see already, the water is penetrating up through the column and this is what is causing the major damage to the temples. In Luxor Temple, this saltwater damage is plain to see and the deterioration has accelerated rapidly in just the last few years. The phenomenon of salt and extreme decay is very, very recent. Over the last 10 years, the symptoms have become quite visible. So we've seen enormous amounts of surface decay where the stone literally turns to sand, to powder, starts flaking and falling off the wall. The salt from the column base is literally pushing the, uh, the uh, capping material right off the base. And you can see where it's just literally heaving in this direction. Part of it's already fallen away. You can see the broken edges here, and you can see where it's completely shattered. In a couple of years, this will all be pushed off onto the ground. In an effort to prevent further decay to the structure, conservators have removed some of the damaged stones from the temple. In many cases, they've deteriorated irreversibly. Here's a fragment that's just a total goner. And um, I keep this here to show 
how dramatic the salt can actually affect a fragmentary stone block. The entire surface has fallen away and as the years go by, more and more of the stone interior itself is just completely turning back to sand. So the forces at work here are absolutely extraordinary. Um, five years ago, this was an intact block with decoration on the surface. This is what we're up against. And the damage is not confined to Luxor Temple. Three kilometers north on the east bank of the Nile lies the Temple of Karnak, the largest ancient religious site in the whole world. Constructed over a 1,300-year period by 30 pharaohs, its reliefs and hieroglyphs contain precious information about ancient Egypt. And yet, in the last 10 years, they've begun to deteriorate as never before. Here is, you know, a very nice relief for uh, the King City I. You see, the, the upper part of the scene here is so stable in a good condition of preservation, but if you go down, you will see the salts affect badly in the scenes. Even in the writing here. I went to visit the Temple of Karnak and the Temple of Luxor, and I saw that the water comes under the temple. You can actually see the water is visible in front of you, and this water eats the limestone. The walls of the Temple of Karnak were completely eaten. When I saw this, I screamed to try to ask the international community to come and save the temple nearby. Fortunately, the call is now being heeded. In a joint project funded by the Swedish government and the US Agency for International Development, a team of engineers are currently working at lowering groundwater levels at the Karnak and Luxor sites. Well, as you see, the groundwater level is very high and uh, it makes it possible for vegetation to grow all to, to the temple walls. This groundwater contains a lot of salt. As you can see, it has crystallized. And we are now going down with our drainage system approximately two and a half meter to permanently reduce the groundwater level to save the temples. The salvage operation is costing five million US dollars and involves digging drainage ditches around the entire perimeter of the Luxor and Karnak sites. The excess groundwater will then be pumped back to the River Nile. But this project is merely a damage limitation exercise. Sections of the temples are already so badly decayed that they cannot be saved. A large part of, of the inscriptions and also of the foundations are already permanently damaged and uh, will have to be the foundations will have to be replaced sooner or later for some of the heavy structures. It's drastic and it's a shock to see. But the work of the Swedish engineering company Sveko is beginning to have an impact. You can see now the water level when, uh, when it was uh, a few months ago. You can see the salt in the walls now. But after we began to do this dewatering project, now there is no any more water. Across the river on the west bank of the Nile, however, the temples continue to deteriorate. The fertile agricultural belt stretching all the way to the temple walls of the Ramesseum provides a graphic example of the damage being caused by over-irrigation. Nowhere is it more dramatically illustrated the competition of land between the antiquities and the agricultural land. This agricultural land is bang smack up to the front door of the temple. The resulting irrigation system has penetrated deep into the temple and undermined the whole area around here. The Ramesseum was constructed over three and a half thousand years ago as a memorial to Ramesses II, who ruled ancient Egypt for 67 years. 
The pharaohs referred to their temples as houses of eternity, built from stone and intended to last forever. But modern Egyptian farming practices are putting these monuments to immortality at risk. You don't have to go far down to actually hit the groundwater here. It's about two feet down from the, the surface. Here we see the process of destruction by the groundwater has, has reached its zenith. The plants have grown through, they've cracked the post completely. It's starting to crumble and here we see finally it's been turned back to dust. But the temples are not only being threatened by damage from salt water. Their survival is also being compromised by an ever-expanding army of tourists. <laughs>